Good afternoon. Um, we're going to get started uh, with the keynote uh, speech. Um, I'm not going to do the introduction. Uh, I was very pleased when we were uh, in the process of planning this event to have a very uh, okay, casual conversation with Scott Fulwiler about what we were planning, and he immediately said, I have a speaker for you. Uh, and he introduced me to, to Paul. So I'm going to let Scott Fulwiler introduce uh, Paul Herb. Uh, 
for the ESG criteria. He says there have been four relatively noteworthy municipal defaults in recent years. This is from 2015. Yeah. Uh, Jefferson County, Alabama, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Stockton, California, San Bernardino, California, and another issue of Philadelphia, which has not defaulted but has recently entered into serious discussions with creditors, uh, creditors regarding its financial future. By using historical data, we can see how these issuers would have been rated for impact, social and environmental criteria, in advance of their default, thereby giving some indication as to whether the factors hit measures could be predicted. The defaulting or at-risk issuers were scored for the year 2000, just the year 2000, eight to 12 years before any of them defaulted. The issuers were contrasted to the full universe of impact rated issuers. All defaulting municipalities plus Philadelphia scored below average in the overall score, compared to other impact rated bonds. HIP scores show that none of the defaulting issuers are rated above the 30th percentile in more than one subcategory of impact. So eight to 12 years before anybody really knew what was going on, and certainly before more, uh, Moody's and S&P had figured out what was going on, you could have looked at the environmental and social criteria of these, of these cities and known that there was some risk. And that's the problem. That's, I think that's a big deal for the world of finance. So I'm going to stop there. It's already probably too long. Uh, and uh, please join me in welcoming Paul. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, very generous. And uh, Scott sometimes says uh, uh, that uh, I'm the Kevin Bilkey of impact investing. Because if you want to know somebody in impact investing, uh, we can connect all the dots together. Uh, I want to thank Scott also for his leadership at uh, in MMT, uh, his excellent presentation this morning, which is uh, completely inspiring, and, um, uh, and teaching, cultivating, mentoring the current and next generation of leaders at Wartburg College uh, and at the Presidio Graduate School. Um, uh, so delighted to be with you at lunchtime. This can be as interactive as you want it to be. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or stand up. Uh, and so I want to thank Pavel for organizing all of us this weekend, um, and Sayyid so Bindlinger for uh, uh, his role in empowering all of us and bringing all of us together. Uh, and so I'm so glad that you're here today, hopefully inspired this morning, not only thinking, but to action. Uh, and hopefully today we can, uh, at lunchtime, we can talk about that for our portfolio. Uh, our portfolios that we interact with, your own personal portfolio, the portfolio of the university, uh, how many bonds get issued by the city of New York, uh, or in Columbus, or even in Granville. So, uh, so we're going to cover that, but the focus initially is human capital. So this morning we heard about uh, how can we go to full employment? What is the gap in putting people to work? The jobs report came out yesterday, and it was a little bit lackluster, and then strangely the stock market grew because most likely the Fed won't adjust interest rates, and that means more party to be had. So this concept of full employment, we'll, we'll get to in the presentation as well, is full employment possible? And to support what uh, Pavlina and, uh, uh, shared with us this morning, and how to do it in an environmentally sensitive way, which Rob uh, talked about. So, uh, and in the spirit of openness, uh, the HIP Investor book uh, essentially open sources 80% plus of how we do our work uh, and go about our work. And like any French chef writing a French recipe book, an ingredient or two is left out. Those are our coefficients. That's how we make money uh, to our clients with investors and advisors and fund managers and retirement plans. But more than 80% of it is there. And, um, and so excited to uh, walk, you, walk you through our presentation today. Um, uh, and as Scott uh, introduced, what we do is we're the morning star of the 21st century. So we rate 4,500 companies globally more than 9,000 uni bond issuers in the US. So those come from government and <coughs> nonprofits. Hospitals issue uh, uni bonds. K 12 school systems issue uni bonds. And the core here is what we're trying to look at, as Scott introduced, is what is future risk? So think about that for your portfolio. What is future risk? And the next time you talk to an investment person, say, hey, I got a question for you. What are your measures of future risk? Because when we talk about finance, we're usually talking about historical risk return. Morningstar has built a billion dollar business by measuring the last five years and longer of historical risk return. But as we all know, 
past performance is not indicative of the future. And it's written on every financial statement. But how do we pick our investments? We look at past performance. And it's not a zero factor, it's a meaningful factor. But it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be in the absence of future results. So thanks for reading this, lawyers are happy. Uh, I'll take it. Oh, okay, that's okay. I'll just take that. So, so today we're going to talk about the value of human capital and how investors like you can finance sustainable prosperity. <coughs> All right, pop quiz for everybody. What is your company's most important asset? I think it's going to go below. All right, everybody. What's your company's most important asset? People. Anything else? What's that? Reputation. Reputation, your brand, anything else? Innovation, ideas. So all of these are assets of the company. And when you ask CFOs, how does your company's leadership view human capital and investing in human capital? It's a wide spectrum. So about one in six says it's a source of value, but there's also some who say it's a cost we have to pay. So the next time you hear a CEO say, or anybody, people are our most important asset, I want you to ask them this question. Where are people on the financial statements? Why are you laughing? Where are people on the financial statements? Their costs, their expenses on the income statement. Anywhere else? Liabilities, pension liabilities, benefit liabilities. Now, sometimes they actually are an asset. So when you buy another company and you acquire it for more than the book value, that asset value does go on the asset side. But it's hidden in goodwill. There's no specific line that says the human capital related to this investment. So you'll see some highly acquisitive companies with large goodwill, and so there's human capital actually built into their financial statements, but that's not what investors and investment analysts and Wall Street looks at. They're looking at operating costs, because the operating profit on a quarterly basis is going to determine whether they make their earnings that quarter. And CEO pay is basically, in many cases, more than you would imagine, is linked to earnings per share. A manufacturable number divided by a number that can be also manipulated by buying back shares instead of investing in the company. So today, and since 2008, stock buybacks have exceeded R&D. So we're investing more in repaying investors to drive share counts lower and EPS higher so the CEOs can get the million dollar bonuses and not investing in the company. All right, so hopefully, let's take a poll. Who here is an investor? Who has an investment portfolio? Who has a 401k plan? If you raise your hand for just the 401k question, I'd ask you, why don't you think of yourself as an investor? So we all have money in monetary portfolio. So many times our portfolios includes this, the S&P 500. So back when most of us were starting our career in the 1970s, the majority of the S&P 500 value was physical assets, manufacturing plants, automotive factories, auto parts, construction. Today, that net was 83%, and the intangible assets on the, um, on the balance sheet of the largest 500 companies was only 17%. Today, that's completely flipped. So in 2015, the asset, the book value, the assets on the balance sheets of the S&P 500 is only one in six dollars. Five out of six dollars of the stock market value in your S&P 500 is intangible. Five out of six dollars are intangible. That means I should be able to go to earnings call and hear the company talk about what's driving that 84%. Anybody listen to earnings calls? You can read the earnings transcripts. They're not talking about the 84%. And if you were driving your car, either in the rain or in the snow or in the ice or in the fall leaves, you wouldn't drive your car with an 84%, the windshield 84% covered up but that's how we drive our portfolios. This makes no sense. And it's only taken four decades to change. And we know there's a lot of technological innovation that's happened, but there's been almost no accounting innovation. That is, besides how to account for new earnings that don't exist. So there actually was a um, uh, intangibles index 
It actually has a name called the Patent Index, made by Ocean Tomo, a company in Chicago. And it launched in uh, the end of 2006. And as you can see from this chart, it actually did pretty good for the time. So it was up 7.7% over that time frame. And the S&P was down 4%. So that's significant outperformance. And then it went out of business. How can an investment fund that beats its benchmark by 10%, 10 percentage points, go out of business? Anybody have a guess? Because no one was investing. Now, why weren't investors investing in something that works? Around something very intuitive, which was, we're going to take all the companies, we're going to look at the patents that they have and they're being issued. We're going to rate the quality of those patents, and those are the companies that should be able to monetize innovation. And they did. Except, they weren't willing to pay brokers to commissions or advisors or big banks. They, this was a niche strategy. A niche strategy about innovation, the only way that value gets created, was not supported by investors. So Ocean Tomo still runs its indexes. And I actually called them about the beginning of 2011 to uh, see what data we, they would uh, license to us. And basically the question for me was, do you know any investors that will invest in our fund? So we can have the right answers, but it still may not be uh, pursued by investors. So that's what we're out to change, is to show how these factors make money. All right, everybody know this guy? Okay. In 1956, he actually wrote, the total wealth includes all sources of income. One such source is the productive capacity of human beings. That sounds perfect. A whole school of economics should follow that, you would think. So that's the foundation that was laid. And uh, Fortune Magazine, since uh, 1997, 98, has published the 100 best companies to work for. All right, does anybody work for 100 best companies to work for? Great places to work? No? All right, well, if you want to, they're hiring. 100,000 jobs. So if you're looking for a job, or you know somebody's looking for a job, go to Fortune, best companies to work for. It's free on the internet. And uh, you can even sign into your LinkedIn, and it'll tell you who you know at those places. So this guy, Wharton professor uh, from my alma mater, uh, who's now at London Business School, uh, started asking the question with this data set, does the stock market fully value these intangibles? So does 84% of the stock market value, does efficient markets work? Because it's a famous theory. Eugene Fama shared a Nobel, Peace Prize, uh, a Nobel Economics Prize. Uh, he actually shared the Nobel Economics Prize with somebody who said markets were inefficient. So I don't know what's happening over there. You can get a same year, same prize, markets are efficient, markets are inefficient. So the focus of Dr. Edmund's work was employee satisfaction and equity prices. All right, so question for you. If employee satisfaction is high and you're a great place to work, do you think that those companies make more money, less money, or the same money as the market? So who thinks they make more? Who thinks they make less? Who thinks it's the same? <laughs> All right, you guys are a lot of abstaining voters. <laughs> Here's the real world performance. So since this information was public in 1997, Great Places to Work is a, not, is a uh, for profit company based in San Francisco. Every year it gets published. According to efficient markets, this information should be widely available. And by the time it outperformed, after three, five, seven years, there should be no differential in efficient markets with this information. The market should immediately price it in because the way Dr. Edmonds did it was to wait till the end of the month. So he even gave everybody a 10 to 20 day running head start to invest in this way. And still today, you can invest in this way and have the opportunity to outperform the market. So the markets are inefficient. Otherwise, you would only need to do index investing. All active managers are trying to beat the market. Many active managers are ignoring this. So over that time frame, just to make it really easy, the market returned an average of six, six and a half percent. In using this strategy, we could have made over that time frame, past performance is not indicative of future return, 11% per year. So how many mutual funds do this? How many mutual funds can you invest in the best companies? 
There's actually one. Called Parnassus, some of you may know it, a socially responsible mutual fund company based in San Francisco. And they had something that used to be called the Workplace Fund, today it's called the Endeavor Fund. Now, how they applied this was they used the 100 best companies to work for as a buy list, a potential buy list. And that potential buy list, then they would try and buy low and sell high. So it was an active uh, application. So it wasn't what Alex Edmonds did, but you can see that it has had positive uh, results. And so this chart only goes to 2012, uh, when it extends to 2015, it still maintains uh, that. But there's no publicly mentioned uh, mutual fund that applies the same strategy. So we've done that at HIP. So back uh, in the beginning of 2013, we launched that strategy. And as you can see, uh, on a gross basis, it outperforms. And depending on what you charge for expenses to investors, uh, it's, it can still outperform. So was that 30%? Uh, what is 30%? From 2013 to uh, the mid of 2013. It is, uh, it is beating you. Uh, I don't have that right here, but we're calculating the numbers for September 30th. Okay. All right, so then in 1970, the guy who said productive capacity of human beings also said there's only one social responsibility of business. And he wrote this in the New York Times, and it became the dogma, which is the main business of business is to maximize profit not to put in the highest quality inputs and make them productive and innovative that results in profit and potential outperformance. What it has done is really focus people on uh, investors, uh, board <coughs> members, and executives on short term. Uh, and interestingly, um, so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is open and free comp competition without deception or fraud. You know, not a footnote, it's actually part of the sentence. Uh, so Volkswagen is uh, encountering that today with uh, its stock being down more than 30% for basically lying about its product. Oops, for years. Oops. Uh, and interestingly, in Germany, you can't sue a company, but you can sue people. So it's going to be pretty likely that somebody's going to jail. Now here in Columbus, uh, there actually is a top places to work that uh, Columbus CEO magazine puts out for Channel 10. So you can look this up online, and there's three groups, large organizations, more than 350 people, so Quantum Health, a private health care uh, organization, Ricard Automotive Group, um, in mid-size, Kenneth's Salons and Day Spas, uh, high, um, uh, with 270 employees, great place to work, and even some small organizations like Cover My Meds, uh, which is an online provider, uh, helping people solve their health care problems. So great places to work can exist everywhere and they can be private or public. Um, so what I've showed you is the public. So Alex Edmonds then um, said, now they've moved to London Business School because unfortunately at Wharton, um, while the students are demanding uh, impact investing and social responsible investing, uh, and the administration has said, yeah, of course we have it here, uh, and the marketing departments and other departments have embraced it, the finance department has not. So Alex Edmonds really didn't have an easy time at Wharton, so that's why he moved to LBS. So what he's doing there now is to show, does this happen around the world? So many of us have an international focus. So what is the relationship between great places to work and labor market flexibility uh, with stock returns? And for most countries, in his research so far, with more than two and a half million data points and monthly returns, it's a positive relationship, except for these three. So I just highlighted these three, since most of the numbers are positive, because uh, this may inform some uh, discussion later. We've talked about Greece and Germany and Denmark. But so the question is, what is characteristic of those labor markets that the um, either A, employees get what they deserve and they get uh, wages and compensation for their talent, or two, the structure of the labor markets? After 2008, whereas we had millions of layoffs in the US, in Germany, there were very few layoffs. Everybody took a pay cut, but not many people got laid off. So it came out of wages, but it didn't come out of jobs. All right, so amazingly, Harvard Business Review has published this article. Put people on your balance sheet as an asset. And they did this before I was born, in January 1967. And there was actually an example that they used, uh, which was a um, apparel company. 
And this apparel company, R.G. Berry, uh, based in L.A. Uh, R.G. Berry stands for the three sons uh, who were there. Uh, they actually showed how human capital can grow your profit. And that you can also put it on the balance sheet. Because if you're putting people on your balance sheet, you have a higher asset value. Now, theoretically, this should make investment bankers very happy. Higher asset base, that means we can create more financial products that run that. Or higher volume, or both. They're not there. So in this time frame, there actually were four PhD teams at different universities. So not unlike today, bringing together PhDs and professors from different universities, saying, how should we calculate this human capital value? And there were four uh, methodologies at the time. So historical costs. What's all the money that we've ever spent? Here? Replacement costs. If all our staff left today, how much would it cost to replace them? Opportunity costs. What would we give up by not uh, investing in our people? And the fourth, and this is uh, what Baruch Lev, who's a professor who's focused on intangibles most of his career at NYU uh, in his 80s, he calculated the present value of compensation. So that, that has actually been uh, what a handful of companies, including more than a dozen in India, have focused on. One has um, applied human capital value, Southern Petroleum Industries in India, uh, using historical costs. But Infosys, which is an IBM-type company, uh, headquartered in India, globally serving the world, uh, and a construction company, um, and uh, another oil and gas company, has used this present value of compensation. So take all the money we're going to make going forward, project our increase in wages and compensation, and then uh, essentially create an operating lease value. So putting people on the balance sheet doesn't necessarily mean I own them. But what it does mean is, if you're working for me, I own the, product, the profits associated with the productive capacity, just like you do when you lease something. So when FedEx and UPS lease jets, those operating leases do go to the sheet. When Starbucks improves property that it does not own, those improvements do go on the balance sheet. So similarly, human capital could be put on the balance sheet as an asset. And this is what it might look like uh, in working through the India Cement Company is, what are all the types that we have? So this morning, Pavlina talked about low wage and high wage jobs, low talent, lower skill and higher skill talent jobs, and then by age. And so what's the expected value of your uh, productive capacity for the time at the company, or how might that change over time? And then you apply, and in India, it's uh, they count, uh, when you count high, they count in lock. Um, uh, and re relate that to the number of employees so that you can get a human capital value to put on your balance sheet. So for emphasis, this actually number ranges in the, in the billions of dollars, the tens of billions of dollars. Because at emphasis, what are their physical assets? Computers, buildings, and desks. And their asset is selling the productive capacity of their people to service customers and create software. So when you actually run that asset number as a return on investment, their 30% return on assets drops to 5%. So this is a mental hurdle that you're going to have to get over is double digit return on asset businesses may only be single digit return on businesses. But that's not the comparison we should make. We should say, what are Infosys's competitors return on assets? And is that a good return? So in banks, they look at our return on assets, they're in the 1% and 2% range. So similarly, this could happen for human capital. So over time, emphasis went public in 1998. This is how the total value of the human resources. And these numbers come from emphasis. They've been doing this since they went public. And the value per employee has gone up. So it's not the number of employees, but the value per employee. So when you actually graph this against their market value, you can see the accounting book value on the bottom, the book value line. And the black line is the human capital value. And the red line is the stock market value. So you can see the tech bubble in the early 2000s go up and come down, and then the 2007, 2008, 2009. Now, look at what's happening to that black line in 2008. It's going up while the stock market value is coming down. What is Infosys doing? in a recession. They're investing in their people. They're hiring from their competitors who are laying them off, and they're investing in training because they're in it for the long haul. They're not in it for the short term, they're in it for the long haul. 
So you can see visually that the multiplier effect when the recession was, was uh, when they were beyond the recession, a higher multiplier on market value came back, which is what should happen if you're properly innovating and getting your productivity. So hopefully this seems totally obvious and intuitive. And hopefully you'd say, well, this is kind of like science. It's not easy to do, but it's, but it's doable. So any of you who are interested in doing this for your company, I encourage you to do it. And here's what's happening today. Interface, who you might know, a company uh, founded by Ray Anderson, uh, the late Ray Anderson, uh, focuses on sustainability. And they have realized that they're, they cannot make more improvements to their physical capital. The, only, the next wave of improvements is human innovation. So with Route 2, they've developed, uh, adapted the methodologies that you see here and used the stock and flow models to say, how do we calculate if our human capital is appreciating or depreciating? So people depreciate when they're not at work, or they're injured, or there's employee turnover, or their knowledge decays. But people appreciate when you invest in them, you train them, you provide health and benefit. And if you're able to promote them to a higher skill or they're even more engaged, that can end up in um, some appreciation, less depreciation, and accounting for the investment. And this is what it looks like. I've blinked out their numbers because they're only internal, but they're essentially gearing up to present this to investors in the coming years. This is something that does not show up in any financial statements. It's not FASB approved, but it's managerial accounting that you can use. And all companies use some form of managerial accounting. So you can do this in your own company or organization, nonprofit, or government if you choose to. So, and as I mentioned before, Starbucks has these line items, leasehold improvements on property they don't own. So there's additional methodologies coming out, how to uh, calculate an intangible value with human capital financial statements. And essentially, investing in human capital is an inflation hedge and can be un uncorrelated to stock market. So it's a, it can be a great investment. All right, so that's part one of human capital. Any questions about valuing human capital? Nope, everybody's ready to do it? Let's do it. Okay. So what I did here uh, was to, the jobs report came out yesterday. This was something we started doing two years ago and then we stopped because it wasn't getting picked up. Um, and so it's something that could be rekindled and, uh, and done you know, maybe through the Institute or through a coalition of us. But I'm gonna show you what we did because it links to the presentations that you've been hearing about. And it's called Where the Jobs Are. Um, and the hint is solving society's needs. So what we did was go to the BLS and the BEA and take all the open source information about the jobs and where they're coming from and look uh, at what industries they're coming from. So we can't get organization data, that's confidential, but we can get industry data. And then we sorted that into business sector, what we call the impact sector. And so we took the industries that were creating impact, net positive impact, to segment those from ones that weren't or were creating negative impact. And then we have the government sector, which should be creating a uh, value for society. And uh, Kathleen showed a version of this chart this morning. So this is a uh, chart showing the Great Recession, uh, the Great um, uh, Job Loss after 2008 compared to others. And that's the 2008 version of the chart. Uh, however, now as of mid last year, we've officially recovered the number of jobs uh, that we started at when uh, that meltdown but it took longer, you can see it right there. And the unemployment rate, this is the unemployment rate from the Great Depression, more than a decade of misery. This is the unemployment rate in the tens and twenties, not the underemployment rate, the unemployment rate. So in context, this is actually what it looks like for our most recent one. It wasn't as bad as the Great Depression, but it still feels pretty bad today. So what we looked at was the US GDP over time, the contribution from business, from NGOs, and from government, and so over that time frame, from 2002 to 2011, NGOs and government were growing faster than business GDP. Now the number of jobs in, uh, as of 2012 was about 70% private sector, 14% nonprofit, and 16% government. So about a third of the jobs are nonprofits and government. 
So what we're able to look at is not only those nonprofits and government, but also slices of uh, private industry where the jobs data would support it. We showed this, that the business sector without impact is destroying jobs. Most likely because they're being extracted. Extractive of people, extractive of natural resources, extractive of trust. Whereas the impact sector that's solving human, social, and environmental jobs is a growth industry. Imagine that. Improving health and wellness. Improving the environment. And this is the impact sector versus the government sector. So at that point, the government sector had not yet shed jobs. Teachers were not yet fired. Local government employees had not been laid off. And so you can look at this across different years. And as you start to dig in, and this, uh, we had a discussion last night about some of us of what models from the government are accessible and are they freedom of information act accessible. So this is a report from somebody who got inside information from the IRS uh, and the BLS, but it is not normally, it is not available. And we tried to get it, we couldn't get it, um, but now we have some new legal friends, maybe we'll be able to fix it. <laughs> So what this showed was for that time that the nonprofit share of employment was growing in education and social assistance and health, but also in things like art. And that that is a source, has been a source of job growth. So this conclusion to this is we should be updating this. When the jobs report comes out, we should have a point of view of what's happening to impact jobs. And more specifically, our companies that, and we haven't done this yet, so this is a new idea for us to do is, Companies with a high sustainability rating should be creating jobs. Companies with a low sustainability rating, like coal or oil and gas, are now shedding jobs, because those are unsustainable, extractive businesses. And companies that solve human needs are growing. So Paul Pullman of Unilever looks like a genius because they, Unilever put a bet that the highest growing revenue is going to come from organic food products and personal wealth. And so he is on the record showing that those are double-digit growth markets for Unilever around the world. So if society's needs are tremendous and business mobilizes talent and capital at a tremendous speed, and the impact and government sector know the solution, there should be some intersections here. So that's the setup for part three of our uh, presentation. And if the number of business jobs would grow at the growth rate of the impact sector, we actually could have full employment. Now, uh, I was using the traditional uh, full employment definition, so we may need till 2020 or 2025 to get the, this morning's definition of full employment, but we should be able to get there if we want to solve human, social, and environmental needs using business as a tool and capitalism as a tool. And as you, I hope you heard this morning, this is what I heard is, our solutions are cross-sectoral. It's not that capitalism needs to get flushed. It definitely needs to get in. And it's not that other philosophies are bad. How do we blend both the pros and cons of what works? And China is doing this today. China has taken capitalism and blended it with their philosophies, culture, and discipline. And so China is about to become the largest clean energy market. And now China has agreed, before the US has agreed, to be a cap and trade market. So at scale and at size, a billion person country is about to go sustainable. Now, there's a lot of things that have to improve in China too, but that is, a, that is the opportunity. How do we get to full employment by this morning's definition or more traditional definition as fast as possible? So HIP, uh, I invented uh, about 10 years ago. Um, so Scott mentioned I used to work at Ashoka. So at Ashoka, we funded social entrepreneurs, nonprofits that were solving health, environment, economic development, human rights issues. These were entrepreneurs because they were getting grants from donors, or they were creating revenue-based fees from what they did. So one of them is a guy named J.B. Schramm. He created something called College Summit. So what was happening is middle of the bell curve kids with a, from a GPA perspective, who were highly talented, were not getting into college at all or into the best college they could. So he came up with a program, a four-day program over the weekend, where the kids would show up in high school and pay 10 or 20 bucks, because that's what you'd spend for a movie or a CD, and they would learn how to write a great college essay. 
And so at the end of this four-day weekend, they would have an essay that they could put in their college app. And at the same time, they went to the universities who wanted these talented kids. Now, why did they have a middle of the bell curve GPA? Because they were in single parent or no parent households. They weren't spending the time with their grades because they were spending the time raising their siblings or holding down a job. So they were natural leaders. And so the thing that I will never forget is when J.B. Schramm said, what is the benefit of what we do? Is that the first kid who goes to college in their family breaks the cycle of poverty forever. And that they make, by going to college instead of high school, a million more dollars over their lifetime. And they save government assistance a quarter million dollars over their lifetime. So what could be better than breaking the cycle of poverty in your family, making a million more dollars in your lifetime, saving the government a quarter million dollars, and then all the other benefits that would come from what we've talked about this morning, being additive uh, to the economy and not perceived as a burden, having a morale and a reputation and a self-actualization. Or, uh, as I saw last night from Pavlino's tweet screen, uh, the Bard College has a prison uh, initiative, a prison debate team initiative that beat the Harvard team in debate by advocating something they didn't believe in on top of it. So check it out. So this is what we have. The opportunity we all have and we're all hopefully focused on in this room is how do we solve human needs, how do we do good, and make money at the same time. And you can think of this as self-interest and group interest. So our reason for being is, how do we intersect self-interest and group interest in a measurement and management system that we can apply to business, social sector, and government to improve the health and wellness and well-being of us all in an economically sustainable way that is ecologically balanced? That's what we're here to do. So let me give you some details. How would we do that? So at Ashoka, when I came back one day from a donor, they said, I feel great about my Ashoka investment. How do I do this in my for-profit portfolio? And at that point, there were things like microfinance around. But the question was, if these goals of health, wealth, earth, equality, and trust, which I derived from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this is a framework that you could use as a company's balanced scorecard, as well as for an investment portfolio. And so if we actually solve these human, social, and environmental problems, we're going to have innovative product, inspired people, increased profitability, and an improved plan. So this is all possible. There's no technical reason why we can't do this. It is all human nature. It's overcoming all the things that we're talking about, of how to overcome this inertia, the things that are designed in the past that don't make sense today. Accounting statements were designed hundreds of years ago but they are not evolving for the 21st century to be that 84% of, of value. So how can you look at this? You can look at this by analyzing the products and services of what an organization produces. So GE has an eco-imagination uh, initiative. More than 200 products, tens of billions of dollars of revenue come from solving environmental problems. Eco-efficient jet engines. Jet engines are not great, but they're much better when they're eco-efficient. Or we celebrate it from United Technology something that we need, using physics that actually uh, go up and down. And a brand that's around for more than 100 years. Then operating metrics, how are you measuring the performance of the company and management practices, what decisions are made. So when Unilever sells health and wellness to customers and customers buy it, it boosts top line revenue, double digit growth rate. When you are more efficient with energy and water, and more productive with people, you have a lower cost or a higher return on investment. And when you actively look not beyond the quarter to years and decades in management practices, you reduce your risk. You reduce your future risk. So essentially, shareholder value from an investment perspective is made up of two things. Cash flow, what's the annual profit, and what investors think about that profit, the price to earnings ratio. What do they expect the growth to be? So in today's uh, uh, investment market, your most indexes are based on the market cap. It says the markets are efficient, and so the market brings in all the information that we have today to give you an efficient stock price, which doesn't happen consistently. There's this thing called smart beta now, which is we're going to look at the factors that drive profit. 
So what they've done is go one step up from profit, which is how fast is revenue growing? How fast is profit growing? And then that will tell you what the stock price will be. It makes total sense. And it's very intuitive to financial people. What is not intuitive to uh, sophisticated financial people who have never run a company, they've only run a spreadsheet, is that the way you create value is by hiring the best people, unleashing their productivity, not being extractive of natural resources, but sustainable natural resources, being inclusive in your governance, and being transparent about how you do business. And when you do that, we're calling that smarter data. To some finance people, it also means alpha. If you do it before the market does it, it's alpha. When the market catches up, it's beta. All right, so what does this mean for company performance? Credit Suisse did an analysis of 2,500 companies. Uh, this is the time period 2005 to 2011. I have a second chart that gets it up to 2015. What they found was this. More than 800 large publicly listed companies have zero women on the board. Now, what's the percentage of men and women in the world today? Half and half. Everybody have a mom? <laughs> hey, next time you talk to your mom, you can tell her about this. Companies with no women on the board made less money with higher volatility over this time period. And companies with one or more women on the board, women who are customers, women who are employees, women who are uh, executives in the company, women who are stakeholders, made a 33% higher premium at less risk. That yellow line is less wavy than the blue line. And so when you look at this over 2015 in stock market value, not in accounting return on equity, but in stock market value, you see the same thing. Now, another question. How many mutual funds can you invest in that use this strategy? Less than five. So this movement to environmental social governance factors, this is one of the factors. This is actually a pretty pervasive obvious factor, and Sally Krawcheck, the former CFO of Bank of America, uh, has a company uh, aligned with a company called PAX, which is another socially responsible mutual fund, and so they have the PAX Elevate Women's Fund. All right, so what are those factors? What's the secret behind making money in the stock market? It's these five things. Customer satisfaction, employee retention, Carbon efficiency, what is the carbon intensity of what you're doing? Coal, oil and gas, plastics, materials. Born diversity, not only for gender, but ethnicity, citizenship, and age. 40% of the S&P 500 revenue is international. So if you don't have an international board, you're taking some risk, you're taking some future risk. And finally, legal exposure. Early in the early days of HIP, we ran an unconstrained model to let the model find the highest coefficients. This was one of the highest coefficients. When a company gets sued currently, in the past, or expected to be in the future, it's destabilizing to the company. Higher risk and lower return. So these make up some of the 30 factors that we look at in rating 4,500 companies. And essentially, all these factors are knowable, yet ignored. They're not frequently on the financial statements. They're not frequently in the, report, in the company reporting. Some of them come from government, like OSHA and EPA. Some of them come from third parties, like Carbon Disclosure Project and uh, Payscale. But when you put it all together, you start to come up with a model that explains that 84% of non-balance sheet value. So now there's enough data to show, and Harvard professors use the same data that we did for this, so this isn't validating of HIP specifically, but it's of the same model. That when you allocate a portfolio based on that, it was 84% of factors, you can make more money. Again, no guarantee, but this is what the data shows. So why wouldn't you do it? Especially now that Harvard's approved it. So an updated paper, 2015, is showing this. There's a group called the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. So we talked about FASB, this is called SASB. So Michael Bloomberg, a Bo the Bloomberg, and former mayor of New York, has foundation has funded uh, SASB so that it can be positioned to have the SEC mandate reporting about all these factors. Now in doing that, not all factors are material to every company. Not all are the same importance. So what this Harvard analysis has shown is, when you take all those factors, and you say which are important for which industry, and you allocate a portfolio to it, you can get 
alpha. Alpha means outperforming the market, either by higher return or lower risk or both. And so this 6% number is a humongous number. If you get 1% alpha, you're a genius on Wall Street. So this is 6% on knowable yet ignored information that is being not applied by investors and analysts. So if you do this in your own portfolio, you have a chance to be smarter than Wall Street. Okay, questions so far? I'm going up and down from things that I can explain to my mom and things that are more technical. Yes, say it. Responsibilities of a uh, 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 director is to maximize shareholder value. So, uh, a group of people conduct together and form B Corp. Right. Uh, I I would like to hear your views about that. Sure. That's that's the first. The the uh, the second one is uh, since the 2008, uh, banks have been changing, and. Uh, uh, and they've got now a lot of young kids with suits and they're from Wharton yes. and New Harvard and they've not been through the crisis and they're all under mandate to, to play the bank and not play the client. Um, but why aren't banks investing this way? Okay, all right, great questions. So fiduciary duty, uh, B Corps, and uh, being the bank versus being the client. So fiduciary duty is a, uh, there's a lot of, uh, just like we have uh, some legal uh, experts and innovators here, they're similarly on fiduciary duty. There's a, a group that are uh, essentially working to explain that fiduciary duty does not mean what Milton Friedman said in 1970, the focus on short-term profit. Fiduciary duty means, how can you have a 100-year plan? How do you manage future risk? So the reason why the, Companies with women on the board do better with companies with no women on the board is one, they're diverse. Uh, two, I could say women are smarter. But what is happening is men biologically have testosterone and they take more risks. And so on a trading floor, men will take more risks and make more money. They will also lose more money. And women uh, bring a multi generational and a wider stakeholder group. And so when you mix those two together, those two views together, then you get this more optimal risk return. So that's the underlying fiduciary duty. The fiduciary duty is how do you make sure this institution sticks around for as long as it can? And so that is, you, there's a growing group of people who say, um, you are not doing a fiduciary duty if you are only looking at your time profit. So that's a re-education process. The B Corp is a approach to bring a legal structure to this. So the B Corp is now in 35 some states. Uh, it started about when HIP started. Uh, so they've done an amazing job, including now in Delaware, where most C Corps uh, uh, and large companies incorporate. And what they've said is this, stakeholder interests have legal standing. And that case law associated with C Corps don't necessarily apply to B Corps. And actually in Unilever, Ben and Jerry's unit, inside Unilever is a B Corp. And there's rumors you know, is thinking about being a B Corp more broadly. Generally, it's applied to private companies. And when you do do that in some states, um, states will give you a tax benefit for prioritizing stakeholders as part of your fiduciary duty. So it's actually a, a good move. We at HIP, we're a C Corp. And we purposely established like a Delaware C Corp to show that by doing this, you don't have to make any legal change. It's a human nature problem, it's not a legal problem. It's a human nature problem of interpreting your legal fiduciary duty in a narrow way. But it's a human nature issue, not a tech. It's, there's no technical or legal reason for this. So on to the banks is the good news about the graduating classes recently of Wharton and Harvard, as well as Ohio State and Denison, is um, it's wired into the graduates of today. So uh, one of the hundred charts that I don't have is Traditionally, when you ask uh, people who grew up in the 20th century, what's the purpose of business? They'd say profit. When you ask millennials today, what's the purpose of business? They say human development. Making the world better through business. So they're bringing that. Now, will the culture of the investment bank 
beat that out as the new graduate. Maybe. But what's happening to the customers on the private banks, the high net worth, and now um, it's starting with BlackRock, partnering with National Resource Defense Council to launch a fossil free index and fossil free fund, is that foundations, high net worth and ultra high net worth clients, are asking their bankers or demanding from their bankers to shift the way that their investments are allocated so that they can have some of these benefits. So the market is creating the demand for it, the smart banks are listening, the banks that are not listening are going to get left behind, and essentially the ones who are listening are being rewarded for being innovative versus extracting. But we're in the middle of that process. JP Morgan, and UBS, HSBC, Credit Suisse, these are... There are groups, well, there are groups inside all those that have groups who are listening. But, it, but uh, some of those companies that you mentioned, if you start out as a uh, new hire, you may not hear about this, you are unlikely to hear about this in training. So if you're a new financial advisor at a large big bank that is, do, that is saying that they're doing this, they're unlikely yet to be hearing about it. So we're in that transition. Okay, other questions? All right, so human capital is important. We can reach full employment. These types of 84% of the factors can have the opportunity uh, to create more value. And what that means is now, from an investment perspective, we should be graphing what's our human impact versus what's the profit or return. And what we're searching for is companies and investments Muni bonds, real estate, that creates positive impact and positive profit. And that is more sustainable. If we're just making profit and, and being extractive, we may not have an earth to live on. If we're just doing good and we don't have a financial model for it, we may not be around to continue that. So what we're looking for is that upper right. So there actually are investments that do that. So Scott introduced muni bonds. This can happen in the muni bond market. Muni bonds are issued by cities, counties, and states. Hospitals and healthcare systems. And even a wellness center in Montana has issued muni bonds. K-12 community college and university. Water and wastewater systems. So Jeremy, who is here, they're replacing the water wastewater pipes under the ground in Newark down the road. They did a muni bond to fund that. Private equity is another place to do it. Investments in small, mid-growth, com innovative companies. Some of them are B Corps to essentially show that you can do good and make money at the same time. Now, in the public markets, in mutual funds and ETFs and, and public equities, it's a mix. And you have these two-headed monsters, like Dow and DuPont. So if you're saying, oh, those sound like chemical companies, go to their homepage. Go to the Dow or DuPont homepage. You're going to hear about sustainable agriculture, nitrogen optimization, and other science to make the world sustainable. And you're not going to see on their homepage the billowing chemicals coming out of the other parts of their business. But what they are trying to do is to transform their business. So the question is, how fast are they doing it, and are they serious? Uh, by putting on their homepage, it at least indicates that. And then there's things like hedge funds, which you probably can't see inside. And so here's the thing about future risk. If I don't know what you're doing, I shouldn't be surprised when I'm surprised. And so transparency is required for this. And so in our model of rating companies and rating unibots, if you do not report information, you get a zero. Because we can't measure the risk, so it is the riskiest thing we could look at. If you report that you're a lagger, you're a bottom quartile, you get some points. Because you're being transparent. And here's the thing about human nature. When you report a number to a group, you are going to improve that number. There is peer pressure. There's expectations. And when it shows that it links to profitability, your board's going to be there. So any type of investor can do this type of impact investing. Individual investors. You can do this in your 401k portfolio. Endowments. So uh, Scott and I met with the chief investment officer. Thanks to follow here at Denison. This is happening in the Denison endowment. That's exciting to hear. As well as in corporate treasuries. So some corporations have signed up for the closed loop fund. What the closed loop fund does, look this up, corporations are using treasury money to fund infrastructure improvements in cities so that they can have full recapture for cradle to cradle life cycle. That's amazing because 
the rate, the uh, return rate isn't that, the uh, interest paid on that isn't that high. But when interest rates are zero, anything's good. And foundations are starting to move towards this. And foundations that have small decision-making groups are moving faster, and ones that have big decision-making groups are moving slower. Human nature. All right, so let me tell you about something really exciting that's happening. It's happening at, uh, starting to happen at Denison. Becker College is a college that's more than 200 years old in Western Massachusetts. Anybody ever hear of Becker College? Oh, how did you hear about them? OK, a friend who was there. And with, what did they study? Right. Yeah, they have a nursing program, animal science program. Um, now they're going to have a social enterprise program. And so that dude at the bottom, Muhammad Yunus, Nobel Peace Prize winner, and by the way, Muhammad Yunus won a Nobel Peace Prize not for negotiating the end to a war. If you read the Nobel inscription, it says, for creating the conditions under which peace can exist. And those conditions are microfinance. Access to capital, like we talked about this morning. When you create capital, you create opportunity. So this is a draft of their investment policy statement, which the uh, Board of Trustees is expected to approve this month. Uh, and so what's on that statement? So here's Becker's mission, to deliver to each student a transformational learning experience that prepares graduates to thrive and lead in a global society. That's their mission. That's why they're here. So the question is, what is their endowment doing? Is their endowment a Wall Street designed, globally diversified portfolio that has no local impact? Or is it supporting this mission? So what's new to this endowment goals is 100% of our investments is going to produce impact, positive impact in line with our mission by the end of 2016. This is exciting. How many of these exist at other universities nationwide? We haven't seen any yet. So this is likely the first to do it. And so their goals are, how do we create health, wealth, earth, equality, and trust? How do our public equities and muni bonds? How do our real estate and private investing support the, the, the impact? And if you look at the top, it's going to be 75% global and 25% local. They're going to fund local energy efficiency improvements. They're going to fund student-run ventures. They're going to fund alumni who have growing businesses that are doing good. Now that is a really neat thing. So this is happening. Uh, and it's going to throw off annual income of about 4%. And it's going to manage the long-term goals with a 50 to 100-year time frame. Becker College is 200 years old. It was started by a couple of the founding fathers. And there will be a uh, Muhammad Yunus Social Business Center located there, the first in the US. Uh, there are 16 others around the world. So for those of you who don't know, Muhammad Yunus, the founder of Benin, was forced to retire by the government of Bangladesh. He had amassed too much power by improving people's lives. So they forced him to retire at 70, while running a profitable nonprofit. This is real world. Can't make this up. So you can do this across your whole portfolio, and um, essentially this shows a point in time uh, of, across all asset classes, these green bars, and these will, this is about a year old, so these bars will move pretty fast actually in the next few years. This shows the green bars are the 10, the 20, or at best 25% of private equity managers who are using some form of what we're talking about some form of human, social, environmental factors in their investments. And you can see the very low numbers for hedge funds and for fixed income. So a way to take this approach in a local way, there's a woman named Lauren Agnew. She's based in uh, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. You can go to this website, B-A-I-I-I. Come up with a concept of the Impact Investing Initiative for a local area. So this could happen in Columbus, New York, Bangkok. We could have essentially a model, a portfolio model, that's customizable to invest in equities and bonds, real estate, private equity, and infrastructure. That creates local impact as well as being globally diversified. It's completely possible if you decide to do it. So what would you invest in if you did that? Well, one way to do that is your cash could be in a sustainable bank. So one thing to evaluate are, are the banks in Columbus, are any of them credit unions or community development financial institutions? 
or a traditional bank that's actually doing this, not only the quality of their CRA, but the rest of their business. So what this shows is there's a group called the GABV, Global Alliance for Banking and Values, GABV.org, and they did analysis, it's an alliance of about 27 banks worldwide, uh, and what they show is when you compare the performance of a bank that makes loans locally to entrepreneurs compared to the globally stable international financial institutions, the too big to fail, the too big to jail, that more money goes to deposit to loans and comes from deposits than the large banks. And that the financial return to the bank is actually lower risk by funding the real economy not the derivative of money. All right, so that's one way. You could put your money in banks. Another is you could put them in muni bonds. This is a state view of how we rate. Scott talked about how we rate cities. This is how we rate states. And this is the impact associated with all of the activities uh, of the state government in each of these states. The south needs uh, some improvement in health and wellness. Uh, Midwest is sort of over the curve. Upper, upper, upper Midwest, North Central, uh, some of the higher ratings. And then the bigger states tend to have uh, more constrained resources. <coughs> so we do this for, uh, HIP has done uh, now 9,000 uni bond ratings. It covers all 50 states, 94 counties. Uh, we're about to take that up to 3,000. And uh, more than 140 cities, we're about to take that up to 3,000. And so this is what a city impact rating could look like. <coughs> what is the obesity, diabetes, and crime rates, or graduation rates of our citizens? It's actually repo uh, reported to the U.S. Census. What is the income, affordability of housing, unemployment rates in cities? That's reported frequently as well. What is the commuting methods and time of duration of people coming in and leaving our city? And what's our population of our city at lunchtime compared to at midnight? And then inequality, how diversified is our city ethnically, gender-wise, <coughs> citizenship-wise? I saw in the airport, more than 100 languages are spoken in the schools of Columbus. It's a very international area. And how are entrepreneurs, ethnic entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs, funded? So for Seattle, they actually do pretty good on these metrics. Uh, when you look at across cities in the US, here's some for Dallas, Detroit, LA, Chicago, New York. Now what's interesting is, you take this equality number, and Detroit, in this the method that we're doing it has the highest number. Why? The average number of women entrepreneurs in the US is 30%. In Detroit, it's 49%. They also have a very high percentage of ethnic entrepreneurs. So the question for citizens as well as investors is, how are those entrepreneurs getting capital? Because they're gonna, they are creating and can create more jobs. But they're in an environment that's not easy to do that. So we even took a deep dive with the protests and the riots in Ferguson and um, uh, Missouri and then uh, Baltimore. Uh, we took a look at uh, Baltimore area. We compared the counties in Maryland uh, in DC uh, Baltimore Metro to the city of Baltimore. And what you find is the suburbs are doing okay and the city is a pretty raw place to live. And so the number of people living in poverty is 24%, whereas the US average is 16%, but in the surrounding suburbs, they're single digits. The high school rate uh, is only 80%. The US average is 86, the suburbs are in the 90s. So there's problems to be solved in the city that the city could help fund, build a coalition around, attract impact investors around. There's many ways to solve this problem. And so what we've heard today are goals that we can use MMT and functional finance and other structures to do to actually solve these problems and to do it through investment portfolios. All right, so I'll be um, wrapping up. Um, you can look at this from a state housing agency, so we've rated all 49 state housing agencies. Kansas doesn't have an official state housing agency, they rate the state. Um, and you can track what incomes uh, actually get funded. Each state actually sets its own level, and some we are really funding middle class housing, not low income housing. You can compare schools, and so what's interesting here is what's the performance of schools like in graduation rates and math and reading scores while also looking at free or free reduced lunches, which is a proxy for the uh, income and ethnic distribu income distribution, uh, which frequently uh, ends up being an ethnic distribution as well, and compare those to that. 
All right, so a portfolio that invests for impact could look like this. You could use a sustainable bank like your resource bank or beneficial state bank uh, or an organization like RSF Social Finance, RFS, RSF stands for Rudolf Steiner Foundation, so the guy who invented kindergarten, uh, as well as uh, a lot of principles of permaculture uh, contributed to that. Um, in mini bonds, you could use hit ratings for your mini bonds uh, and invest in that. In the private side, you can go to some place like Lending Club, which is peer-to-peer -peer loans. That's you being the bank. So Saeed asked, well, how can you be the bank? You can be the bank by going to Lending Club and prospering. Because what it does is collect people who want to borrow for credit card refinancing, for school, for self-improvement. And then the technology spreads your loan 25 bucks at a time. So if you want to invest $2,500, you can fund 100 people. And then just like a bank, when one of those defaults, that accrues to you. And you can pick what risk you want. You can pick whether you want to be high risk, medium risk, or low risk. Now the interesting thing is when you analyze that curve, when you analyze that curve, the net amount, depending on your risk, is a very, uh, not that, you know, it's not, it's a slope that doesn't look like this, it's a slope that looks like this. Okay, um, and then we've applied this ourselves. Because the financial industry has not innovated, you cannot find really a sustainable real estate fund to invest in publicly. So we created one. So we're like Morningstar in that we do ratings, and we also have set up some strategies like we showed you the best companies and sustainable real estate. All right, so that's what we have. And so the last thing I'll mention is that um, the Newsweek Green Rankings come out every year, and we've been fortunate to be part of that this year. Uh, and our contribution is rating the products and services and industries of companies. This has actually sent a kind of a shockwave through corporates. The Newsweek Green Rankings had mainly focused on internal efficiency. Now it's actually focusing on what the products and services do when customers use them. Uh, and that has gotten some companies really agitated, like uh, companies in the gaming and gambling industry, because they had high brand reputations and last year's score, and now they have a low product score. So I spent about 12 hours with those companies and the gaming associate, trade association to say, you can prove to us that uh, you're doing a good job. Everybody who comes to the casino, you give them a card. This already happens, right? This is a new thing. So they're tracking who's gonna get the free room that night or the free drinks. You also have their 90-digit zip code. When you have a 90-digit zip code, you can bring that down basically to a block. If you know what block you live on, I can guess your range of income and assets. So what I've requested of the gaming industry is, Calculate all your customers and what they're gaming individually related to their income and assets. And if you can show us that that's a reasonable number, that that's an entertainment expense, because they'll say coming to our casino is like going to Disney. And go to Disney for less than 100 bucks a day, that's what people spend at the casino. So if they can show that they do that, they can earn a higher score. But until they show that they can do that, uh, we don't know. All right, so thanks very much for your attention. Uh, happy to answer any questions now or for the rest of the day, and uh, really appreciate it, and I hope that we, everything that we hear today we can implement and take action on, because it's up to us. It's our money, and it's our uh, citizenry. So let's keep uh, people in power accountable, and let's vote with our dollars. Thanks.